Um, so welcome to Helping Others Use Your Data, Lessons from the Field of Neuroscience. Um, my name is Crystal Steltenpole. I'm the Training and Education Manager here at the Center for Open Science. And I'm joined uh, by some folks from the um, Max Planck Institute in Frankfurt and also um, Neural Imaging Data Model. Um, and so I think maybe we can start um, with a couple of introductions and uh, for folks that are interested, feel free to use the chat to talk amongst yourselves. Um, if you have a question uh, for the panelists, um, please use the Q&A function. I, I'll help to, to monitor that and I'll, I'll, um, uh, I'll get that started that way. Um, but first, yeah, let's do some, some quick introductions. Maybe the Max Planck folks can start first. Maybe I can go for it. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining in for this very uh, nice seminar today. And thanks, uh, Crystal, for introducing and starting off. I'm Praveen. I'm from working at the Max Planck Institute for Empirical Aesthetics in Frankfurt, Germany. Um, I'm involved in a project. Um, so I'm uh, working as a research software engineer involved in a project which tries to build a structured data, metadata framework called Genymead. You're going to be hearing more about Genymead very shortly. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, first, thank CUS for the invitation and also allowing us to actually present our work on metadata template here. I'm Zafan Zheng, and I'm uh, doing my PhD at the moment at Max Planck Institute for Imperial Pathetics under the supervision of Lucia Maloney. And my scientific project focuses on to understand the how to distill the consciousness from the cognition or uh, cognitive functions. And uh, so, but at the same time, my PhD is, uh, is um, undertaken and uh, is uh, uh, is uh, sponsored and also supported by the Fair Research Workflow project. And in this project, we aim to develop the Fair Research Workflow that is fair, not only fair for data, but also fair for scientists and also fair for science. And today, for the metadata part, is we want to show that part of work on the fair fairness for data part. And uh, thank you. And the uh, NIDM folks. Uh, I'm Carl Helmer. I'm at the Mass General Hospital. Um, my group builds data management uh, tools and um, for large scale studies, but also just for sharing of data. And um, I'm currently working on the ontology part of uh, NIDM. Uh, hello, I'm David Keeter. Uh, a research professor at the University of California. Uh, I do neuroimaging research and then neuroinformatics research, and I guess the history. Um, so uh, Carl and I were involved in the Biomedical Informatics Research Network project in 2005. Out of that came a working group on data sharing um, and how to model derived data, and uh, lots of people joined in from MIT, Satra, Ghosh, JB Pauline, and so forth. And over the years, we came up with uh, the neuroimaging data model is kind of what we, what came out of that working group. So nice to meet you. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. Uh, to get us started off, in case there are folks that are they're new to the concept of, of metadata uh, in the audience, I was curious if folks would be willing to share what what is metadata? Why is it important or beneficial? What are some important considerations when thinking about metadata? I can, I can go. Um, so metadata is, is the usual definition of metadata is data about data. So it's uh, normally terms that are used to describe the data that you're collecting or acquiring in an experiment or something like that. And it's the data that's, that's used to describe the data you've collected. The, the goal is really to um, have a complete set of data so that the, uh, or metadata so that the data can be reused in a, in a reasonable fashion so that you can tell as a data consumer that this data is um, the data that you're interested in and it's possible to be um, combined with potentially other data that you might have collected um, uh, elsewhere. I, just to chime in there, I think one of the simplest forms of metadata is what people call data dictionaries, right? That's just simple definitions of your variables, you know, what they mean, what data types they are, what their ranges are. I mean, that's the simplest form of metadata that we like to encourage everybody to collect and share. 
And one of the main um, uses of uh, data is to help, um, one of the main uses of metadata is to actually help reuse the data. I think this is one of the key terms in the word fair that is going around a lot. And this stands for findable, accessible, inter reusable, into interoperable and reusable. And all of these are very, very important for data so that um, uh, not just data, but any research object per se. And um, metadata helps make research objects fair. So if it's now my turn, uh, so also yeah, just just like what uh, <laughs> three of you have uh, described very beautifully. So having the metadata will make the data more findable. Uh, if you have the metadata of uh, of of the data set, then this metadata information itself, it's just like you, once you have the dictionary, it will be very easy for you to find the word you are looking for. Uh, I don't know if do we have more time on this question because we can go a little bit. We you can go a little bit farther in in my view um, than simply describing the data set that you're sharing. If you did processing on the data, you know, metadata might be what software did I use, what version was it, on what platform. I mean, all these details become exceedingly important. And I don't know who the folks are that are you know out there because I can't see you, but uh, you know. Uh, depending on who you are, I mean, if you're doing uh, brain structural volume research and you run the, the same software on different platforms with different operating systems, you get slightly different answers. And so that metadata, if we're going to go and reuse the derived version there of the structural volumes, you know, we need to know what platforms you ran it on. And even, you know, down to that level of detail would be fantastic. Um, and so that's, I think, what, what most of us are shooting for in the tools that we develop, helping you as users, you know, uh, capture this information so that it can be shared with the data itself. That's a really good point, actually. So to capture the context in which the data was created, I would say. So you're actually getting a bit to the next question that I was going to ask, like what, what need does metadata fill within the neuroscience community, right? So it sounds like under some circumstances, it can be really important the the context in which the data was collected um, and and what software was used to process it. Uh, are there other are there other needs that metadata helps to to fill within the neuroscience community? Well, I'll just say um, one of the things that when I give talks about this this topic, one of the things I usually start out with is is a folder that says the word Thursday on it, and and. <laughs> The, the idea there is that, you know, the postdoc has left, um, you've got a folder that has some results in it, and it, it's labeled with Thursday. So you really don't have any idea, you know, in what context this was generated, uh, what, what point was they were trying to get at what hypothesis they were testing. So metadata is, is really something that you're trying to collect and store with the data so that you have some sense of, as Dave was saying, the context in which derived data was was generated, but also the the context in which and acquisition parameters for which the data was acquired. Um, there's you can go even further and you can um, tag the data with metadata that what is this supposed to be used for? Like what what hypothesis is this testing? Um, because often that can be um, an important piece of information so that people can understand why the experimental paradigm what was what it was um, as well. Okay, I always have things to say. So um, in the context of neuroscience, also Alice's. Um, so if you're going to identify, so if you're doing functional neuroimaging, uh, and you might identify uh, regions of difference between, uh, you know, whatever the groups are in your comparison, you usually use an atlas to localize where those functional signals are. Those atlases are all different, um, as you might have found uh, <laughs> in your own work. And so understanding what atlas was used to identify the, the area, or if you're identifying cell types, you know, what atlas was used to uh, derive the cell type um, is, is important metadata when we want to combine data. So this is like when you want to search. So say we go out and want to search and get all structural volumes of the amygdala. 
well, the amygdala may be different in different atlases. So once we get the data back, we'd like to see the metadata to know what atlases were used here and there. And we might be able to put in some you know, covariates for that or well, transform things from one atlas to another. And so it sounds like it's also really helpful for standardizing across different types of studies, potentially, or at least acknowledging where there may be differences in definitions and yeah, and that's that's um, a good point. It, that's something I was talking speak about earlier. Is that if you want to combine data sets, you know, there's there's many data sets that are available in neuroimaging at this point, which is what we do with. Um, but if you want to combine those those data sets into an even larger data set, so that you have statistical power for whatever you're looking at, it's important that the data that you know um, the acquisition parameters, for example, of how it was collected, so that you can figure out. Is this data, data combinable? Is it, um, you know, or am I just introducing more variance in, into uh, the final result that I'm going to get? Yeah, I think it uh, slightly going away from the neuroscience community. I think it totally depends on the particular scientific community on what they think should go along with that data set. If they find themselves using one particular aspect of the data, then that specific distinguishing marker should be uh, included along with this data as a metadata. So it's extremely important that the community itself identifies what very nicely describes their own data set and uh, provides that as uh, their metadata along with it. And that leads to another important point. This is simple. Uh, is, this is what I work on is is um, coming up with a common language, a set of terms that the community has agreed means a certain thing and can be used to describe um, the um, uh, the data. So in a simple example in neuroimaging is you know someone's done registration on the data. Well, have you done linear registration, non-linear registration, 12 degrees of freedom, six degrees of freedom? what? you know, what, what does registration mean in the context? And so it's, it's very important to have a set of terms that people have agreed, this is what the registration process is, and here are all the different kinds of registrations. We're calling them, uh, you know, a common set of terms to describe these things so that when you look at the metadata that someone's generated, that you actually understand what those terms mean and how that person used it. Because that's, that's, really uh, the heart of how metadata can be used and be useful is if everyone understands that it's the same, uh, the same meaning. Yeah, so, so I- Oh, go ahead, Stefan. Oh, yeah, so I think this uh, cause point leads beautiful to the point of uh, easy, to the importance of ontology in, in making the metadata template. So um, everybody ca could have different definition of registrations, but once the community is adopting the metadata template that is based on the ontology, standard ontology existing out there that is well defined, uh, then that this uh, this will make the metadata template much more, um, much more accessible, and uh, it's based on the the community consensus. So to verify my understanding, um. In if I were to take an example, potentially from education research, um, and so people are talking about maybe defining um, the population that was involved uh, in a study, and they say something like middle school, it would be important to define what middle school means, right? Because it could in some areas be grades six through eight, it could be in some areas grades seven through eight, it could not exist as a concept in some regions. So it's important for everybody within that community to to kind of understand, like, if we're using this term, that this is what we mean. Yeah, one simple. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, so one simple example is that age. And in China, the when we talk about age, it's actually like normally now, for example, in the West, uh, my age is 27. But actually now my age in China is 28. Uh, so, but because people calculate the age in different ways. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah so, go sorry, ahead. I was going to say that's a great point. Um, in that it doesn't, it doesn't mean that everyone has to use the same definition. It's just that you need to know what definition was used for that particular data. 
So if he says I'm 28, you need to know what calendar are you using or how, how that was um, arrived at. So thank you. Um, to talk a little bit about each one of your the projects that you guys have been working on, um, Zephan, I was wondering if you could tell us a bit about the cognitive neuroscience metadata template um, and how this tool maximizes the the fairness that uh, findability, accessibility, interoperability, and reusability um, of neuroimaging data. Um, so I I have the presentation or like uh, or just a verbally answer. You can talk, or if there's something you'd like to share, you can. Um, it's up to you. But just oh, a so, few minutes, maybe about about that about that template. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, uh, so so the main point of my metadata template is slightly different from the the metadata template of being is proving together. So my metadata template is actually mainly dedicated to the enhanced the findable discoverability uh, the, of, of the data set. So right now, so for example, right now, the uh, scientists just have a hypothesis. The uh, hypothesis must necessarily be neuroimaging, just like, OK, I have a hypothesis that boys are taller than girls. And how can I actually find the data out there that actually enable me to make this uh, test the hypothesis? Then to test this hypothesis, I need the concept the, the, or the measure of height and also the condition measure of gender, uh, the data set of this kind. But if without a metadata template, the scientists can only just like brainstorming in their mind, oh, which paper out there actually recorded these two data? They recorded these two information and also open their data. So then the scientists have to go to the papers that he brainstorming his mind. And then probably sometimes this paper that has should have the data set, but it's not open accessible, the other one, uh, mostly not open accessible and uh, some some are accessible but this is very inefficient efficient so um so i'm trying to put out the template in which we are trying to describe the experiments and also the state of the data set itself so that the people can actually uh just based on this metadata template people can actually easily search which conditions this experiment was conducted and uh and which kind of characteristics this data has, what is the data standard, something like this. Awesome, thank you. Um, uh, Praveen, uh, can you tell us a bit about Genomede um, and how this framework um, can help researchers who are working with large open data sets? Sure. Um, Genomede started off as, um, um, started off initially as uh, when, we, when we tried to create an electronic lab notebook, for neuroimaging. So as Carl once mentioned previously, um, lots of neuroimaging data and all of the necessary metadata along with this data were written down in standard lab books. And there's a lot of um, um, scribblings all around the pages related to various stuff, lots of noise here and there. And when you had to find out or uh, search for a particular scan or a partic particular run, you had to go through book log a lot of pages of logbooks from years ago. Um, the initial approach was to try to digitize it. And as we were trying to digitize it, uh, it became important to try to gather not just the, the data related, the metadata related to the measurement itself, but a lot of information related to the context of this measurement. So what was the project? This, pro this measurement, this data was uh, measured as part um, who were the people involved? There is always the researchers who are involved. There is always the subjects who are involved. Uh, now, when we are talking about researchers, um, were they right-handed or left-handed? Could this have an impact on the measurement? Maybe, maybe not. But once we start to collect large amounts of data, um, it helps to have metadata like this, which may answer future scientific questions um, at some point in the future. Um, so generic neuro metadata descriptors, that's what GenMeet stands for, essentially tries to capture all of this context of a neuroimaging experiment together. Start off from a very high level of projects. Um, what was the project? What were the, who were the ethical committee involved? Who were the people involved? To very, very low level of um, describing things in space and time, that is, 
if there is a measurement going on in the lab, what were the devices present in the lab? Because um, the devices are all there, um, but typically the main measurement device, the MR or the CT or the MEG machine is what is noted and registered. But it may be that there are other devices out there that are interfering or causing noise with this particular device. And typically in a neuroimaging experiment, there are lots and lots of devices all uh, scattered about the room for generating stimuli, getting responses back, um, tracking the uh, movement of the eyes and so on. Now, each of these devices may have an impact on the resulting data. So it makes it, it, it becomes very important to try to systematically capture all of this information in a very structured manner. And that's what um, Jenny Meet tries to approach. So when we're talking about devices, it's not just the device itself, but also how the devices are connected to each other. So this then brings us to the wiring diagram part of it, where we have 10 devices in the room. Um, we also would like to know and capture in a systematic way how the devices were connected during this particular experiment. Um, so we've covered the context sort of sorts, the project, who are the people involved, the researchers, subjects, and the devices. And then finally, we come to trying to gather information about what was actually happening in the experiment itself. So what was presented on the screen? What responses were provided? Was it auditory? Was it visual? How do we um, capture all of these? Now, in this process, we are trying to reuse as many terms and ontologies that are out there. But wherever we find um, missing pieces, Jenny Mead uh, provides a placeholder. So as a new researcher starting off in new neuroimaging, as a, as a PhD student, say, who's performing their first neuroimaging experiment, Jenny Mead would tell them, OK, you want to make your data set findable, accessible, uh, interoperable, and reusable? Start off with this. This is a list of metadata fields you can start off filling which captures or tries to capture everything around the experiment. And um, yeah. that's pretty much summarizes Jenny Mead. Awesome. Thank you. And um, Carl and Dave, can you tell us a bit about uh, uh, NIDM and how it helps researchers find and reuse data sets? Yeah, so uh, Carl and I talked, we're going to tag team that, <coughs> excuse me, tag team this. I'm going to start and then uh, hand it off to Carl if that's okay. <clears throat> and I wouldn't mind uh, sharing just a couple slides, might give some people some context and some something to look at. Um, so you can see the slide. Okay, so the basics of NIDM, NIDM was built um, off uh, the uh, PROV specifications, which is a family of documents used to describe provenance in uh, any domain, really. And uh, it's built on uh, the resource description framework, semantic web technologies, and it allows you to make statements about data. So that's basically what semantic web and PROV allows you to do. You make statements about data. This is that, uh, you know, bills, age, 24, something like that. And if you use the right vocabularies, then everything sort of uh, self documents, if you will, or provides you with metadata about what's going on, because you can dereference all the terms that are used in these RDF documents, they dereference to uh, landing pages for websites, and the description is there. The neuroimaging data model was set up as a, uh, a model using these uh, core technologies to describe neuroimaging data in uh, service of uh, being uh, findable, uh, retrievable, and reusable. And the neuroimaging data model has a simple hierarchy. It's just got a project, a session, and these acquisition entities and activities, which allow you to essentially put together very complex graphs of information uh, about your data and about derived data. Um, and so in order to uh, make this work, one needs, uh, beside, oh, sorry, one more thing uh, before we go to that. You can then take these RDF documents, you can serialize them into text in a variety of ways. There's a variety of formats, JSON, uh, LD, which is the linked data version of JSON, which allows you to take the keys in JSON and link them together with uh, properties um, and relationships and so forth. So it's a, RDF is, you know, a very powerful thing, um, starting to be used by Google and others to facilitate search on the web. And so we decided, hey, can you use this for neuroimaging? But what one needs to be able to use this for neuroimaging are complex vocabularies and uh, proper data dictionaries so that we know what data uh, 
is available, what metadata is there, what the variables are and so forth. So uh, we went about, um, so these, these efforts over 10 years have been funded by a variety of, of, of groups, including the NIMH and the Wellcome Trust and uh, ReproNIM. Um, I saw Dave Kennedy on the um, a list of people attending ReproNIM, Reproducibility in Neuroimaging uh, Grant is one of the or centers is one of the best places to go for reproducibility tools and techniques in neuroimaging. And so uh, what we did was basically uh, started down this path, tried to create the NIDM, uh, the NIDM data model, tried to model some information. So in the neuroimaging community, there's this brain imaging data structure standard, which organizes data. I have a picture here, um, organizes your data in a uh, uh, defined directory structure and file naming with file naming conventions and where some metadata would sit. And that was very useful for the neuroimaging community to share data because now you know where to find the structural MRI for subject 21 in uh, a directory when somebody sends you a data set. But there's not a lot of metadata built into the BID standard and you couldn't search across BID's data sets. So what we said was, well, NIDM is good for searching. Um, RDF documents have a variety of search engines uh, and search uh, formats like Sparkle and whatnot. You can do, uh, you know, distributed uh, dis distributed search um, very easily with RDF. So what we'll do is we'll take this uh, bids structure and we'll model it with an IDM uh, data model and put a little document at the root level that's this RDF document. Then we can search across these um, data sets by searching uh, using vocabularies and relationships um, and so before I, I'm not going to get into that, I'm going to let Carl talk about that because it's much his work on terminologies and ontologies relating to NIDM. But uh, I just want to give a shout out to um, the, uh, let's see, sorry, um, the NIDM Terms Grant, which was from the Brain Initiatives and NIMH funded to create such vocabularies uh, and ontologies surrounding, uh, involved with neuroimaging data. Because what we found when we went out to the ontologies and terminologies that were out there, either the terms weren't properly or well defined, they just had a description, but no units or, you know, no extra information, or the terms we needed were just not available. And so that's where Carl comes in with his expertise on um, helping us in this NIDM grant to develop these neuroimaging terminologies so that we could use them within NIDM, so that we could convert data sets to these metadata documents. These metadata documents then go live in a metadata or graph-based database. It can be distributed. And now we can do searches across data sets. Say, find me all data sets that measured age, measured uh, depression, and had uh, you know patients of a particular type, those with major uh, depressive disorder diagnosis or something like that. And we don't care how you measure depression, and we don't care how you got your diagnosis. At this level, we just want to find out how many data, and that had structural neuroimaging, how many data sets are out there, Let's get those data sets back. Now we can look at the detailed metadata, why it's so important, and find out how did they measure depression? Oh, they used the BDI over here. Oh, they used something else over here. And how did you make your diagnosis of major depression? And then for my experiment, is that sufficient or do I want to reshuffle the, the, the subjects? Okay, that's what I had to say. Uh, I can't find the stop sharing button. There it is. All right, thank you. Uh -huh. Carl? Yeah, so, um, and the other thing that Dave mentioned is, you know, there's collections of terms out there, but uh, sometimes there there is no definition. So um, that was another problem we ran into. Um, so the, the other thing that's important with the work we've been doing is really to um, make it possible so that people can annotate the data to some arbitrary level of detail. And to give them the flexibility so that if the exact, you know, uh, diagnosis method that you use for depression is, is important for what you're doing, um, that you have the ability to put those um, the, that information in there. So some of the work that I've been doing, we started out using PROV, um, which is uh, a very simple uh, ontology that you can um easily model workflows. And essentially that's a lot of what scientific data is. It's just one giant workflow from acquisition to the, the data use. And, and so that, that seemed appropriate. The, the issue with it is that um, there are many more terms that you would like to model that are not modeled within PROV 
and it becomes a little bit difficult to reuse some terms because they're not built on the same philosophical uh, underpinning. So um, my current work is really to take the initial NIDM uh, experiment terms that were based on PROV and move them over to the basic formal ontology uh, BFO and um, build a scaffold based on BFO and uh, the ontology for biomedical investigations, and then uh, build a scaffolding that we can put our domain specific terms on. So because of that, then uh, if you have this, this scaffolding that people can use and then the community can contribute terms and um, grow the scaffold for their particular domain. But that's that's what essentially what we're trying to do is allow other people in uh, different domains to build on this as well. Thank you. And we did get a request. Um, if uh, folks have links to their projects, would they be willing to um, post them into the chat and, and make sure that um, it's going to everyone, not just the hosts and panelists. And then we can also include that um, in the email uh, that we send out after the webinar, along with the recording. Folks are really interested to, to dig deeper into that. Um, so thanks for sharing that. I'm I'm curious in in all four of your uh, work, what are some of the challenges that have that exist, or maybe even that you've specifically run into for coming up with field wide schemas or templates for metadata? Um, if I may start first, actually the biggest problem is because we want to make sure the whole metadata template is machine readable and it's based on existing ontology. Um, so, for example, in cognitive cognitive neuroscience, cognitive psychology, when you say um, backward masking, people might sometimes even call it sandwich masking. People just call it masking. Um, so, we must when we want to describe the experiments, for example, using the terminology of the paradigms, then we have to base on existing ontologies that define what it is, what we mean by one paradigm. But the problem is in the in currently in my field, it is uh, the, the, the ontology out there is very sparse. And there has been very little efforts that has been conducted to develop ontology. Uh, and some there has been some extensive systematic efforts that try to develop ontology, but um, it was not also well maintained. So the biggest problem is the ontology problem. And as long as we have the very profound ontology, that describe the experiments profoundly, and we will that will make the metadata template building work much easier. Yeah, if I could uh, jump on uh, on those points, um, the maintenance of the ontology is is extremely important, and that's one thing we found. You know, there are ontologies that talk about imaging, but they may not have been updated since year two thousand, and technology moves along, right? And the way people understand. Um, cognitive tests are different and, and the field moves on. And so it's very important that, that the ontologies be maintained. Um, but it's also important that, that we have some kind of understanding of the, these subdomains and subcultures within a, a domain that you're trying to model. So different subcultures, uh, if I can use that term, you have different ways of using terms that you have to be cognizant of before you can, you know, make it something that everyone will use. The other thing is there's a difference between um, what we sometimes call personal data elements, which is what you call things in your lab, and um, more common data elements, which is what everybody agrees we should call this. So a lot of times what you're doing is you're building spreadsheets in a lab or, um, and you've got your own little system of how things are called there. But then someone needs to do the mapping from that, from those local variables to, uh, as he was just saying, to the ontology, to something that everyone can understand. And that can be a, a challenge for the researcher. So it's really important to get people aware of the ontologies but um, so that they can just use those terms right, right from the beginning, that would be the optimal thing because then everyone understands right off, off the bat what, what these things are, or at least to build tools to make it possible for them to map their, um, you know, the, their existing data um, to an ontology that everyone agrees on. This has this has led to a couple of questions um, from from our audience members. Um, 
Uh, one is, are there official ontologies, and, and are these ontologies versioned at all? There, there is. Um, there are official ontologies. Um, there are uh, repositories of ontologies that you can, there's one for the all the ontologies that are based on the basic formal ontologies, for example. Um, you can you can find those easily in the web, and these are versioned. Um, one thing to look for in in reusing ont ontologies or terms from ontologies is whether they're being maintained. A lot of ontologies are moving to GitHub so that um, issues can be you know discussions of terms and issues with terms um, can be discussed. And then that's the great thing for the user is then those discussions are public and you can see why certain decisions were made which really helps you understand the ontologies. Using that team science approach. Exactly. Um, we've also got a question um, uh, about it. it I'll just read it. Uh, a lot of discussion rightly is about why metadata capture is hard, um, particularly for the end user. Um, what are some, uh, sorry, particularly for the end user, what are some current ideas about how this can be made easier? I, I totally see why um, um, I totally see, understand the question, and um, um, I always like to think of um, putting in metadata in in a spectrum. On one end is easy human friendly metadata, on the other end is machine friendly metadata, which is and should be the ultimate goal. And the more we tend towards machine friendly metadata, the harder it gets. And um, a simple logbook is very human friendly. People can write it down, but uh, creating a complex ontological, ontology-based um, metadata structure makes it very difficult to put in the metadata. And people typically, scientists typically, don't have the time and don't think it's important and enough to put in the time and effort to actually put in all of this metadata in there. So it's. Uh, I would say it's important to find a sweet spot somewhere in between. And um, tools, particularly software, can actually help make this easier. So abstract away all the complexity is involved in creating RDF files, for example, or JSON LDs, and try to make it as easy as possible for people to put in important metadata to describe the data, at least the minimum set of metadata to describe the data. And um, yeah, I think this is still work in progress and every community tries to approach it, it, this in a different way. And um, it is uh, it's a difficult thing to actually get all of this metadata in there. Yeah, that's a great point. There's two things that are important there is, one is that the field comes up with um, an MIS, a minimum information standard, so that when things are, you know, data sets are submitted to a repository or to a paper that that there's a, a set of metadata that is accompanies that, um, and that people have generally agreed that that's what you would need to understand the data. The other part that my group works on too is is building tools that that work as close as possible with either the acquisition computer, so that as Praveen said, you, you know you acquire data and all this stuff just gets written into a metadata, or all the acquisition parameters just get written to a metadata file. So that you don't have to, you don't actually have to do anything. Um, we found having people not actually have to do anything is the best uh, measure of success uh, for, um, and the, the greatest uptake in the in the community. Um, but that those two things I think are really important. Yeah, I was going to say um, we've spent um, a good amount of effort in the neuroimaging community to build tools to help users do this. Uh, it was also why the brain imaging or BIDS data structure was created, because that's the sort of easy entry point for humans to kind of organize their data in such a way that then we can build tools on top of that to uh, allow you to annotate your metadata or help you create data dictionaries. And so through ReproNAM, through the NIDM work, uh, we've got even a grant that's being reviewed on uh, building user interfaces to allow you to create data dictionaries for your data, whether it be in comma separated values files. I mean, it doesn't have to be neuroimaging in that sense. It allows you to create these data dictionaries that have sufficient properties so that they are reusable. 
and then um, other tools to take bids data sets and create an IDM documents uh, to take uh, data that comes out of software that analyzes data and uh, grab metadata and in our case, put it into an IDM. But another aspect of this is to somehow to get the tool developers to write out sufficient metadata in a structured form that then can be reused by all the groups here on the panel and everybody else, whether they're using an IDM or some other, you know, metadata representation. And so we put in a lot, some effort anyway, into how do you get tool developers to do that? One way is to create libraries for them and give them working libraries that they can incorporate in their software. But hopefully, um, eventually the software developers will see the value of structured metadata and output that from their tools so that we can use it. So I think it's, it's all about the tooling. And then it's about the carrot or the stick. How do you get users to actually do this? Uh, the users who have tried to reuse data in the past they're, uh they'll do this because they're like, yeah, I had a CSV file with, uh, you know, I mean, columns, I had no idea and I can never find the person who created it. So it's totally worthless. Um, and but the younger students, you know, were uh, through Reprenim doing a lot of reproducibility training seminars for the young uh, students to show them from the get go. Here's how you do, you know, what we think is proper research, um, documenting your your data sets and so forth. So they are reusable in the future. So maybe the next generation it will be much better than <laughs> the current one. Yeah, it's great that you mentioned CSV files because we've got a couple of questions about um, software and how to capture metadata. Um, so, um, you know, we've got a question about, do you always need software to, to capture this? And um, what what recommended, what recommended software would you, or what software would you recommend for, for capturing uh, metadata? What are some of the best ways to, to do that so that you can then share it with others? Yeah, in our field, um, that's a little bit of a complicated um, question. <laughs> um, there's, there's, it helps if the field has a standard data format. So, in, um, there's two standard data formats in neuroimaging. There's the acquisition format, which is DICOM. There's the the format that everyone then converts the DICOMs into to do the processing, which is Nifty. Um, so. So it helps just in general if, if those things exist because then other people can write tools. Um, whether or are there tools that that consistently pull metadata? I, I think the answer now is no. There are a lot of tools out there, but is there one tool that that everyone um, can use in all fields that that just doesn't exist yet? Mostly because the the uses of the metadata are so varied. It's, that's kind of like the holy grail of of, uh, of metadata, I think. Yeah, I mean, we have with the Pine IDM tools, which there's a link to the API in the chat. Um, there is a tool, CSV to IDM, and but what that, I mean, it's, it's low tech. I mean, these are all research projects and in development. So as I mentioned, we have a grant that's being reviewed to develop a uh, proper web-enabled user interface. This is a command line version, CSV to IDM, but what it will do, is allow you to take any arbitrary CSV file and it will pull the variable names out of the header. It will iterate over those variables and allow you to define uh, the properties for your data dictionary, for example. And then it may it also allow you through some complicated mechanism. It'll go out to some ontologies or terminologies and allow you to attach concepts to certain variables. These are higher level descriptions. So that age is a measure of you know, I don't know, time since birth, and, and it doesn't matter how, you know, if you did it in years or months, it's prenatal, postnatal, at that level, it's just about being able to query across the data set. So this kind of tool will then output an IDM file, but you don't necessarily care about that. It'll outlet, output, output also a JSON um, a data dictionary file, and that can be edited in any text editor. So it kind of gets you into a place where you have some kind of data dictionary that has properties like units and ranges and things. And potentially it also lets you, if you have categorical variables, define the category. So that's kind of a simple way of getting in to the game and at least getting a data dictionary for your CSV file that you can attach. Um, there's a, there are other tools. I mean, one could even use Redcap the database, right? And put your form in there and you get a data dictionary out because you have to describe all the variables, you know. Um, but there are, there are some for Excel too. I can't remember the tool from the, open science crowd, um, but they're not, 
general across all domains. They're usually very specific, like Carl said. So right now in our team, we're actually developing a metadata template using CDAR. Um, it's like, yeah, so the CDAR is a platform, basically the metadata template, uh, we, we are building this metadata template, so it's just like a form. And uh, so um, we are building this metadata template on CDAR because it enables us to actually connect the entries with uh, existing ontologies out there. So that is the why we actually choose CDAR. And basically we are building this form that could connect ontologies out there. And this form actually in the end sits, now our, our plans is sit as some data repository, for example, Dryad. We are now having collaboration with Dryad and potentially uh, OSF as well, if possible, that in the end, like people, every time when people upload their data sets, they can manually fill in this metadata template and to describe what happened actually in the experiment. So I'm curious about what recommendations you would have if there's somebody perhaps in a different field um, is is working on improving metadata related practices in their own field. What what recommendations would you would you have for them in getting started in that work? Uh, by in my view, when uh, so it's it's about consensus within your. I think uh, a lot of this is sociological and, and it's about consensus in your field amongst the people. So, you know, I would encourage you to get together folks that are interested in that topic in your field, put together monthly webinar or monthly calls uh, that where you get together like a working group and you sit down and decide what, you know, what do we think we need in our field? And then, um, you know, you go off and create the different components, whether it's tools or vocabularies or whatnot. I mean, that's a really good way to go. Um, I think because, you know, you have friends, you have a team, um, you're not doing things in a vacuum, because this is about data sharing, you really kind of need it to be open, and you need to get buy in from other people in your domain. So I'd start there. And as a pre step for that, I'd say look around and see what's out there, because there may be something you can already reuse, or there's a starting point that uh, you could build upon. And uh, just to pitch in, once once there is a starting point or a common uh, uh, set of terms agreed upon, it helps to um, publish a guideline or a template out there so that people can actually refer to this and point to this as a stepping stone for future work in the community. So it always helps to have um, a guideline published where people look to this guideline when they want to release their data sets. Yeah, RepoNim is a good, I just put the web link for RepoNim. Uh, I forgot to do it before in the chat window. Um, it's a good, re I think it's a good resource. You can ask the RepoNim Center for, you know, their guidance in these things. They do webinars all the time and training uh, for folks, and they have lots of good tutorials on metadata and things. And I think they could be a resource for you, even if you're in a different domain, to get some ideas on how to start and where to go. So I'd encourage you to reach out to We also have a, a question coming in from the Q and A. Um, is it possible to share too much metadata? Um, yes, uh, especially that, especially when you're dealing with human subjects. I mean, there's there are definitely personal health information rules and, and HIPAA compliant rules, and there's EU standards, um, and so one does have to be very careful about what one shares. Um, and those things are all documented on the NIH website, for example. And um, yeah, so when I'm developing this metadata template, because it has required the potential users to fill in this metadata template uh, by themselves manually. So that's actually some some kind of, uh, so to some extent, there's also some kind of the actual work. So while, so like one of the, one of the, one of the aspects that we're trying to be cautious is actually not to make the metadata template too long, but at the same time as informative as possible. So yeah, that's uh, that's kind of uh, 
struggle that also we actually have. I'm curious also, how has working with metadata affect you, affected your personal research workflow? Like how you conduct research? How has, you know, centering metadata affected that, if at all? Well, uh, I, because we've realized um, over time um, that data is it used to be you require data, it would sit somewhere that might or might not be accessible to other people. Someone might know that you have the data, you give it to them and give them some general instructions. But now, um, because of these sharing requirements, um, we realized, and I think most people are starting to realize that it's much easier to share the data if metadata has been attached to the data at the beginning. And this is what Praveen was saying, right? Like as early as possible, get the metadata into some sort of system so that it follows the data around um, because doing it at the end it can be very painful especially if you know someone's writing in a book and trying to figure out what what it was that they did six months ago um, so what we've really worked on is think about at, at the very beginning of the experiment already be thinking about how you're going to share the data and what metadata do you need to provide to make that data shareable and always think about you know uh, what I like to tell my, my students is uh, think about writing the method section. Always keep that in mind because that will help you always make sure you have uh, enough metadata to describe the, the data you're taking to other people. And so if you've done that in the beginning, then uh, sharing would be a lot easier at the end. And, and that's one of the things, that's why we're kind of doing what we're doing. Assuming your metadata or your method section has all the details. <laughs> There's a lot of papers that it, they don't have all the details. You need all the details. <laughs> right, exactly. I mean, my, my dream is when the method section of future publications are just JSON files or any other structured data. So uh, there need to be no text in there, just information. Um, in my personal experience, I, I wouldn't say um, because in my field right now, uh, I, I'm personally, I, I, my degree is focused on cognitive neuroscience, but right now I've, I'm also conducting a lot of analysis on the behavioral data. Um, but there's also oh, actually no existing metadata and template out there actually describe the experiments. So mainly my experience is just feeling the pain. Uh, uh, so, so actually, in my field, there's ab absolutely never any metadata, tem metadata template. But recently, there's just one guy who just uh, collects all. He studies confidence, and he just uh, collects all the data sets, writing the author of these papers that that have collected confidence ratings, and he put all these data sets together and put all of them together in one CSV file, and uh, just like there is no proper metadata like in there. But but in the end, I recently I found a research question, and uh, I uh, I feel like maybe some data sets in his data set in his database is usable. And actually, going through there in the end, indeed, like I found like I I managed to replicate my results uh, on thirteen independent data sets in the database, and that actually gave me the feeling, oh my god, when we really every data data set published out there has a proper metadata template. Like metadata information that described in experiments, I will be able even to find out more, and I, we can actually save so much money collecting new experiments. And if I want to collect the data of these thirteen independent data sets within my PhD, I will need at least five years. Yeah, I, I love that because I think that we've moved in in our field and anyway in neuroimaging beyond what can be accomplished with one labs money and data you know you really need larger data sets to ask the questions about subtle effects now and that requires us to reuse data and it should be reused right uh you know all the people in the world who pay money to the governments that give money for us to collect the data i mean you know all this money is being used to grab to collect this data it should be able to be reused for science into the future and combined and that relies on us to at the beginning when we're collecting it annotate it properly so that it's usable. I think it's the burdens on us, but it's for a good reason. 
think that leads nicely into my last question for you all today. Um, I was hoping we could end uh, uh, hearing from you all about um, something regarding what, what's something regarding metadata that you would like to see happen within your field within, say, the next five years. And feel free to go pie in the sky if you'd like. I think I already mentioned this uh, method section that is not text, but um, um, anything structured, structured metadata instead of uh, a descriptive text in the method section. Yeah, I I think the you know the push to make data available um, as a precondition for getting it published has, has been a really great thing for our field. Um, and I think now it, the burden is kind of on us who have been pushing for this to develop tools so that the average user in the, in the lab can, um, can more easily attach metadata to their data because it's, it's a, a, a process, a learning process for people, you know, like, oh, what do you mean I have to use standard terms? I've always called it this. And, you know, now you're telling me you have to do this. This. So I, I think we need to, if we're going to ask people to share the data and we've demonstrated the the usefulness of shared data, then it's really up to us to develop tools to make it easier for the, the end user. Um, I, I think I, I'm not a very optimistic person, but I envision that in the five years, in the following five years, people actually start to realizing importance of maintaining developing ontology once the ontology is there metadata templates is a very easy problem i think maintaining is the is the key word there because there are currently lots of ontologies out there and uh, eventually yeah. they fall into disuse and disrepair yeah just like how people maintain Wikipedia. So I guess maybe my add-on to the five-year thing would be is that funding agencies also realize the importance of ontologies and maintaining ontologies so that they don't just fund the development of the ontology, but they, they uh, recognize the importance of the ontology to the field and, and um, importance to their um, the sharing of data that they've required and the money available for it. I, I I agree with them. Everyone said uh, it's like it's great. I mean, you need yeah, you need you know journals to be requiring that data be shared and open with the publication. You need structured method sections, like some of our panelists said and others commented in the chat window. You know, we need funding for tool development in this domain and for uh, data science tool development. But also, like Carl says, you need additional funding to maintain it. I mean, we all have to put in these sections about how we're going to you know, keep our tools going into the future without, the, you know, funding from our various agencies. I mean, I don't know how you do that. I mean, it, you know, you need funding to keep these things. If you want to make good software that we can reuse and good ontologies that we could reuse, I mean, the funding's got to be there to keep them maintained um, into the future. And I don't really know how you do that. We, we try to do the things we do, collaborating with people, trying funding over here, little bits over there but it's not how things are done in the commercial world. And we have good software tools from commercial companies because there's money behind it to maintain them, to upgrade them. I mean, one library changes and it breaks everything, right? If you use that library, you know, you, so yeah, we need money for maintenance. Um, anyway, I guess those are my comments. Awesome. Well, thank you. Thank you, everyone who's in the audience for coming today. We hope that you you enjoyed this discussion. Thank you to our panelists uh, for sharing your expertise on metadata and, and advice for folks that are hoping to, to enter and continue to do this work. Um, and thanks for the Center for Open Science for, for hosting this. Uh, we're very happy that you all were able to join us today.